Welcome everybody. This is a new um, event of the Power BI User Group uh, Italy. And uh, today we, we have the pleasure to have uh, Gerard directly from, from Austria. He is a lead data engineer and cloud solution architect, Microsoft MVP and SQL Server Analysis uh, Server Maestro. He will talk about uh, the VS Code extension that he developed uh, himself uh, in order to manage Power BI. It will be a very interesting session, so stay here with us. Before we jump in, uh, just a brief introduction on, uh, on us. Uh, for people that don't know who we are, we are a, a community, an Italian community. We talk about uh, all that is related with business intelligence and data, obviously in the Microsoft uh, uh, environment, but we had also session on other kind of uh, environments. We used to organize virtual meetings uh, at, mm, every two weeks usually, uh, but uh, in this period we we pushed a lot and we had the meetings, free meet free events uh, in a row. If you want to stay up to date with uh, all the stuff that we do, uh, you can find us in uh, our social uh, channels, LinkedIn and Meetup in order to be always uh, up to date with all the events that we do. YouTube channel in to find all the recorded session. This session will be recorded and put on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can find us also on uh, X and uh, the Fabric community site. And if you speak Italian, you are more than welcome to join us in Telegram. We have uh, uh, chat rooms that where we talk about Power BI and data in general in Italian. All the links to join us are in our link tree uh, link. I will post it in the, the chat so you can reach it uh, very quickly also. Uh, what's next? Uh, we will have Marco Russo on the 20th of February. He will talk about DAX Optimizer. It will be a session in Italian because we, we are lucky to talk uh, the same language. So he will be an Italian, an Italian session. Um, we have other session in uh, work in progress that will be scheduled in March, but we want to spoiler you that uh, we will be back live. Since the COVID, this will be our first event and it will be organized in Milan in Microsoft House. It will be uh, 16th, of, uh, 16th of April. So you will have more details on what we are going to talk. Uh, there will be a stunning venue, stunning set of speakers. So uh, if you are in Milan that days, be sure to be there. More, more details to come. Stay up to date. And uh, just a reminder for all of you, this is an open community. This is a community made of people. And if you want to make uh, you be part of it, don't be shy. Just drop us an email or a direct message, whatever you want. You could be a presenter. You could be you could could help us moderating session. You could uh, create materials, video pills, demos, contribute to our YouTube channel, whatever you want. Don't be shy. We are here to help you if you want. And uh, with that, I leave the stage to Jared. Thank you very much for being with us. And stage is yours. Awesome. Great. Let me take the screen. And also start my presentation. OK, you should see my screen, right? Yes, we see you. Yeah, first of all, thanks Ricardo and Alessandro for having me and giving me the opportunity to also present my, my Power BI extension of Visual Studio Code. Um, quick quick forward, uh, who am I and what do I do in the in the um, data community um, around Power BI and Fabric? So my name is Gerhard. Um, I've been in the Microsoft data world for, I don't know, almost 20 years now. I'm um, always had a passion for analysis services and well, obviously Power BI. Um, I'm also blogging about those topics at my blog. Um, you see all the information there. Um, besides that, well, I'm obviously also developing um, tools for the community, one of them being the Power BI extension of Visual Studio Code, which we do a demo afterwards in the presentation. 
but I'm also developing other stuff. So there's also another Visual Studio Code extension that I'm uh, maintaining for Databricks for those who also work with Databricks. And I have also built a Power BI connector for um, Delta Lake. Um, yeah, I'm working at a company called Pico, where we focus on building um, data and AI solutions for our customers. Um, and as you can imagine, um, there is always like when it comes to visualizing um, the results, um, Power BI is obviously our, our tool of choice. So that's why I'm still very um, strongly connected and using Power BI very heavily. I'm also um, part of the data community Austria, former Pass Austria chapter. Um, where we also organize um, physically physically meetings and and virtual meetings and also um, like an, a bigger conference once a year, usually in January. So we just had our last one in uh, end of January, the Data Community Day in Austria. So if you if you pass by, um, you may also want to, to join that that conference or one of our meetups. Okay. So yeah, let's get started. I prepared a very small agenda. I want to give like a brief idea on how I actually um, came to the idea and the motivation to to implement a Visual Studio Code extension. Um, then we talk briefly about the implementation itself, what it takes to build a Visual Studio Code extension. Um, I'll show you some of the features, um, which I will also demo afterwards. So it's pretty pretty straight. And yeah, so. If you've been working with Power BI, especially with the web UI, you probably realize that some um, some ways and on working with it are not really user friendly or sometimes also not really um, intuitive. Uh, for example, if you want to check whether a data set was, was refreshed successfully the last times, it takes like five clicks to actually get there and see the proper error message, et cetera. And then even like that error message is like super, super small and need to copy it out, et cetera. That's all stuff that I didn't really like about the web UI, especially knowing that there are actually um, APIs that exist that more or less can provide you the very same um, functionalities. And there are even API calls that don't have, but that you can't actually do in the UI itself. So it provides more, the API provides more functionalities that are available um, in, in the web UI. Um, so whenever you wanted to use one of those um, API functionalities, for example, like binding a report to another data set, so I don't like taking your, your dev report and connecting it to the production data set, um, it was, it's not possible in the, in the web UI, so you always need to do like some, some API call. I used to use PowerShell for that, and in order to run the PowerShell code, I was, well, actually starting up Visual Studio Code. So it was just made to me to, that I also want to develop like the extension for, for Visual Studio Code to, to manage my Power BI tenant. What's also very important, um, as I mentioned before, I did also develop a similar extension for Databricks. So I already had some know-how how to do it in, in, in Visual Studio Code and how to write an extension that communicates with an external API. So that was very important and that was, also already familiar with all the ecosystem and APIs that exist in Visual Studio Code and what's doable and what's not doable, and also like was already aware of some best practices, right? So, well, that's the whole idea behind um, the implementation. For the implementation itself, well, it's in Visual Studio Code extension. Those are written in TypeScript or JavaScript or Node.js. Um, so actually, like my, it also was like my first encounter or my first time I actually used TypeScript, but I got into it pretty fast and it's pretty intuitive, I would say. Um, and what the extension itself actually is, it's basically just a nice UI um, around the existing REST API calls that you may already know that exist for Power BI. So they are very well documented in, in, the, in the Microsoft Docs. Um, and I'm basically just calling those APIs from Visual Studio to build up the UI. What's nice about Visual Studio Code in that in that particular case is that it has authentication for um, Azure Active Directory or Microsoft accounts in general already built in, so there wasn't really much that I need to needed to do. So it could basically just say, okay, generate me a token for Power BI API, and um, I could already use this in all my API calls. 
Um, besides this basic API functionalities that are implemented, I recently also added some new features with regards to Tyndall, a tabular model definition language, and the tabular object model um, to extend the capabilities um, that, that do not exist for APIs, but only for um, the tabular object model library. So I added basically another piece of code like a proxy that allows Visual Studio to communicate with the table object model library using some kind of C sharp.net proxy. Okay. And yeah, everything that you'll see today and that I've developed is open source. There is a Git repository uh, in the background um, that you can well obviously have a look at. And I'm also looking forward for, for any contributors in the future. So if you if you think that's interesting what I'm doing here and Maybe you already have some background in TypeScript or Visual Studio Code extensions. Ideally, um, I'm very happy to take take any contributions. Yeah. So um, yeah, let's get started. What what's actually included, or how how do we get started? Um, first of all, what you need to do is well, you need to install the extension. That's pretty straightforward. I'll show it in the in the demo afterwards. Uh, once you have installed it, um, you are, can do a couple of settings um, for for the extension. Um, none of them are mandatory, so it's just if you um, have some specific requirements, for example, if you're not in the public public Azure cloud, but you use some governmental cloud or China cloud, or I don't know, there's a couple of, of different cloud um, providers um, in Azure, um, you can use that. It's All of them should be supported. Obviously, I couldn't test all of them, um, but I had some people doing that for me. Um, it also works if, for example, especially for me as a consultant, I'm usually working with my customers and my my, my company's account is invited to their tenant. So it also supports um, guest users. So if you're invited to to a to a customer to a customer tenant where uh, where you're working, um, it's also supported. You in this case, you can just support uh, provide the tenant ID here, um, and it will then um, also work. The same way as if it were your your regular tenant or how you connect in, in the power bi service um you can also optionally specify a azure active directory client id if you have like some security um constraints or permissions that you want to use but it's actually working pretty well uh with the with the built-in capabilities that are provided with which is to decode authentication um there's also two settings related to the um, tabular model definition language and the proxy that I mentioned before. You can also use um, a dedicated client ID for that. Um, otherwise, you will actually be prompted every time you are connecting to or you're using the, the, the tabular model definition language um, features um, when you're connecting to the data set. Basically, the very same dialogue that pops up when you for example, Open Tabular Editor or ALM Toolkit or any of the other um, external tools for Power BI that use the XMLA endpoint. Okay, once you've configured everything and uh, you're logged in, um, the first time you basically get prompted for authentication. It says, okay, yeah, the extension Power BI VS Code wants to sign in using Microsoft. You click Allow, then you basically get redirected to your browser that asks you for the login so you provide the credentials um and then you're basically ready to go if you already um signed in with another account it also shows up and, and asks you whether you want to use that account or sign in into another account and it's very important here once you're logged in that that login is basically or that account is actually stored and you don't have to provide the login info information um again the next time you log in so that's pretty convenient so yeah, what's in there? Um, there's a couple of parts. One of them is basically um, what so-called tree views, um, which are exposed in, in, in Visual Studio Code. And on the left side, you see the tree view for the workspace. So it basically, it's like a Power BI workspace browser that, that just shows you all the different workspaces that you have access to. You can basically drill down to those workspaces, see the data sets, see the reports, see the dashboard, see the data flows and whatever is underneath. 
all of those items have um, other specific um, actions defined. So for example, you can also refresh a data set from here. Just right click the data set, say refresh, and then all it, it kicks off a refresh for you. Um, and also some other capabilities that, that I will show afterwards. Um, next to that, there is also three more tree views. Um, the capacities, the pipelines, and the gateways. Um, capacities and gateways are actually read only. It's just for information. So the APIs were there, so I just thought I'll, I'll implement them. Um, for the pipelines, so that's basically Power BI deployment pipelines. Um, you can also trigger deployments from here, so I will also show that. So if you have um, already use, if you are already using Power BI deployment pipelines, they will show up here, and you can also do like selective deployments of particular items from from Visual Studio Code without having to go to the um, to the Power BI web service. The next feature um, is notebooks. So. We are also providing um, functionality of notebooks for those of you who um, work with, um, with Jupyter. It's, it's it's very similar. So you have like those different cells, and each of the cells can contain one or multiple commands. Um, and then basically, when once you execute the cell, you see the results uh, below. So for example, we uh, we provide three different uh, ways how you can use those notebooks. Um, first of all, you can um, execute arbitrary um, API calls. So for example, if, if any of the functionalities that you're looking for is not yet in the UI, in the workspace browser, for example, um, you can create your own API calls. Pretty straightforward, as you will see afterwards. It's also some IntelliSense in there, which allows you to um, inspect the different um, endpoints that, that exist. So that's pretty cool. Um, another cool feature is um, that you can actually execute ducks from Visual Studio Code. So as you can see here in the in the middle, um, I'm basically like have like a percent ducks, which is so-called a magic in, in notebooks. And then the notebook basically knows that the text or the input that follows is basically a Dux query, and we just take it and send it to the execute queries um, API of the of the current data set. Just a very simple one, but you can basically um, write any Dux that that you want. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Um, something that I just also added recently is the support for Timsl, so the tabular model scripting language. Um, there probably aren't a lot of use cases for this yet, so I'm still um, looking for some 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 motivation or some some examples where it actually would make sense. But we could also execute Timsl scripts um, from from Visual Studio Code. And the last part is that we can use variables. Um, as for example, at the top. Um, we can have like this CMD cell and say set a variable, and this variable can then um, be used in um, in other API in other in other cells. Okay, that's so. Notebooks is one of my favorite features, actually. Um, yeah, Timbal. So that's something that was added recently. Um, it basically allows you. So I guess most of you will probably be familiar with with Timbal, which is like a, a new um, way to define uh, your tabular, mo tabular models um, definition and, and data structure, uh, which is much more readable to the to humans than the, the BIM file or this huge JSON that was used to be generated for um, for defining the data set. So you can now basically connect to an online um, data set expose it as Timbal files, do some changes here, um, validate your changes and also deploy it back to the to the online data set. So that's that's pretty cool. Um, as you can see, there's also some some syntax highlighting um, so that like a table is written in blue and the dimension, the table name is written in, in, in purple. Um, that's not part of my extension. Um, that's part of an extension that's provided by Microsoft, uh, which which does this highlighting for you. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why I very much like Visual Studio Code because you have like different parts that can can just play together very well um, to build a really cool solution. Okay. 
Yeah. Everything that you see in the demo afterwards, um, it's also working in the browser. Okay, so it's not tied to your um, to your local Visual Studio Code instance, but you can also just go to vscode.dev, um, go to extensions, install the Power BI um, extension, and you basically will have the very same functionalities in the browser that you also have in uh, in Visual Studio Code on on your local computer. So that's like one of the features that I also very much like about the Visual Studio Code extensions. That if you if you write them in the right way, um, they are also usable from from any browser basically. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, that's for the last one. And then I would just jump to to the demos. Um, what I've done there is are, I've can I interrupt you one second sure. because there is a question in the chat. Uh, uh, Victor is asking uh, if uh, everything that you are going to show and uh, probably everything that you have developed in your uh, extension is fully supported by Microsoft uh, or that's something that is not supported. Um, as we are only using official API calls and the table object um, model library, everything is supported. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, so I prepared a little um, demo Power BI file um, that I'll show you briefly. So it's it's basically using AdventureWorks, um, a sample database from Microsoft. Um, I'm loading from an Azure SQL database. I do have a couple of parameters um, where I can specify the server, the database name. I have um, parameter for load options that I like to use to, um, to keep the, well, the data under control that's actually loaded to the file. There's like a list, it can be full, empty, or limited. Um, I also have some um, incremental refresh configured, so that's why I have range start and range end. Um, I have this refresh delay that just runs or simulates like a longer running query so that I can like, yeah, well, simulate a longer refresh, so that's it. And the rest is just like regular tables um, that are linked to a data model. I created two measures, Sales amount and sales uh, quantity a hierarchy. So it's it, yeah, it's it's just to to give you like an an idea of, of what the data set that we we will be working afterwards looks like. Nothing nothing really fancy here. Okay, so let me close this and save this. And yeah, that um, data set is saved locally in my folder. And what you would usually do is you can just write once you have Visual Studio Code installed, you can just say okay, open this code. And then it it would open that folder in Visual Studio Code. Okay. Um, it should ask me for um, the workspace um, because I also have uh, have it associated with the workspace. Okay, that's not working anyway. Um, and what you would do is you would first of all um, go to this extension tab, search for Power BI. Um, it's actually only showing. Two extensions, um, both are, are from me at the moment. Like this is the main extension, the Power BI VS Code. But I would actually recommend you to, to use the other one. This is an extension pack, which is just like a bundling of, uh, of two or three um, other extensions that um, work well with, with my Power BI extension. So one of them is the, um, the Tyndall syntax highlight link from Microsoft. And the other one is so-called data table renderers that I use in the notebooks to actually visualize the tables properly. Okay, so you would just go here and install this extension pack. And once you install the extension pack, you will see that um, there is this new Power BI icon showing up on the left side. Okay, so once you click it, basically logging you in. Um, if it's the first time that you open the extension, it will ask you um, for for the uh, for the user. And for the credentials, as you've seen in the in the screenshots above, um, I'll focus on the workspace for now. So I'll just collapse the others. The question that always comes up, like if you have like not only like ten, but maybe you have hundreds of workspaces in there, uh, you can just click here and and press Control F and then like filter for I don't know Project A, and it will highlight you those that match this the filter. Um, so that's just like standard Visual Studio Code functionality that also comes out of the box. Um, yeah. Okay, so what I want to do is 
basically um, I created project A, that's my sample project, where I already have loaded like a couple of data sets in here, um, some reports, also some dashboards and some data flows just for demo purposes. And what you would usually want to do is uh, you want to upload the, the Power BI file that we just worked with um, into your workspace. OK, so what you would usually do, you either go to um, the Power BI desk and click publish or you go to the Power BI service and import the PBX file. Um, that's valid ways. Uh, what you can also do, so I um, implemented some drag and drop, so you can just go to your uh, solution explorer, take the PBX file that you just had a look at, um, drag it over to your workspace, just drop it here. And it's basically now uploading that PBX file to your workspace. It's already here, so it will create another one. Um, I will delete it afterwards just for you that you see, okay, can just use drag and drop to basically deploy um, data sets. Okay. So, so that's the new one that has been deployed. Um, you remember that we, we um, created a couple of parameters. Um, you can see them here and you can also change them here. So if you want to um, change the database, um, you can just um, do it here. So if there is like a little pop up at the top that asks you for database, like the name that you provided, and then you can just change the database or change the server name, um, etc. What's also really nice is um, if you're used to um, changing parameters in the Power BI service and you provided them like um, as a list so that you have like three different choices. In the Power BI service, it doesn't really provide you those choices. It's just like a, a free form text field. And if you don't know what those choices are, you're basically screwed. Um, what happens here, like if, if you like those lo this load options parameter, if you edit this, I can also um, expose those, those different choices and allow you to um, basically select them. And once this is done, it refreshes and now you see, OK, I will just change this one to full. Okay. So that's how you can easily change parameters. Um, you can also um, have a look at the refreshes. Obviously, there hasn't been one yet. So what we would do next is we just say, OK, right click the data set and do refresh. Um, as this data set resides in a premium workspace, uh, we would have the capabilities to do all the different refresh operations that exist in, in analysis services. Um, usually you would do a full refresh. If you, for example, just like added a new calculated column, then um, process automatic or process calculate would also be enough. Okay. So I'm just starting a new refresh. As you can see, it's popping up here. Um, take some time until it's actually starting. So what happened in the background, we basically um, created a, um, an API call to, to trigger a refresh. Okay. okay. So I don't want to wait for this, so I'm going back to my to my other data set where, where I already have some refreshes in there. So as you can see, like um, you get a list of all the refreshes that happened for that data set in the past. Um, and you can also um, click on, on one of them to see all the details. Um, okay, so you see, okay, all the tables have been refreshed. If there would be an error, you would also see that error here, um, et cetera. Um, if you have a refresh running, you could also cancel it from here. Um, yeah. Um, I also provide the information how the refresh was actually triggered. So um, you can either trigger it from the Power BI service, then it would, I think it would say manual. Um, if you're using the advanced uh, enhanced process refresh API, then it says via enhanced API. If you refresh it via SQL Server Management Studio, it would say XMLA endpoint or XMLA something. So that's just some, some additional um, information that we provide here. Um, as you have seen already, maybe whenever I hover over one of those items or any of the items in the in the tree view, it gives you basically all the information that's exposed by by the API. So you can find some more information there. Even though I tried to, the most important information I'm basically already providing in the in the name and in the details here. Um, yeah, so 
that's the refresh. As you can see, there are um, other options too. Um, you can update parameters, which will basically like just iterate over the parameters and ask you for each individual one, uh, as you've seen before. Um, you can backup and restore a database or a data set if you have um, the Azure storage configured. Um, this again, like requires this this um, this additional um, table object model features that implemented with this C sharp proxy. Uh, we'll come to that later. The same is true also for the edit Timble, um, which also uses that proxy. Um, Gerard, there is a question in the chat. Uh, yeah. They ask you if um, the refresh that you are showing are API refreshes. Uh, and if you can use manage also XMLA and Tom refreshes. Well, you cannot trigger them, but they would show up here. OK, Thank so you. whenever I click refresh here, it's it's using the enhanced refresh API. Um, but if the data set was refreshed from the service or from management studio using XMLA, it, the refresh would also show up here. OK. That's clear. Thank you. OK. Cool. Um, so yeah, there are some more um, options. There was also some some things that are available for all API for all items that you see in this tree. For example, you can copy the API pass, copy the connect. Well, connection string is, is uh, specific for the data set, but copy the ID or the name to the clipboard. So. And also very important, you can just say, OK, open that data set in the Power BI service and it will like open a browser for you and jump directly to that data set. OK, that's not only working for the data set, but also working for the report or whatever item you click. Um, yeah, moving on to the reports. You can see there is a couple of reports in there already. Um, and we have some more or some other options here, so we can basically clone a report. We can well download the whole report. We can rebind the report and update content. So that's just different um, options, especially the, the rebind and the update content that are only available via the APIs that do not exist in, 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 in the web UI. So you can just rebind this report and say rebind, and then it gives you a list of data sets that you have recently um, opened. You can say, OK, rebind it to that data set. And now basically it will just open that very same report, but um, with a different data set in the background. OK, so that can be very useful if you want to, if you like, did some changes in your report and you want to test it against the production data set, you can just say, OK, rebind to, um, to my production data set, and then you would have production data in your, in your data, in, in your report. Gerard, there are uh, there is a question from Victor that uh, uh, asks if there's a limit uh, in megabyte when you download a report from your interface. Uh, probably, um, it's basically the very same that would also apply um, when you would download it from from the web UI. But okay. for a report, it should usually not be an issue because the report usually is a thin report that just has a live connection to the data set. Yes, you can choose when you when you use the UI, you can choose which if uh, downloading the fin report live connected or you can yep. choose to download the, the, the PBIX with the data inside also. Yeah, to be honest, I'm not sure. <laughs> so let's just give it a try. This one, I hope that's the one. Just see it. There is a bug that it doesn't provide a name. No, that's a different one. OK, that's weird. OK, I have to look into that. I usually just download the report. Um, I guess it would be a live connection usually. Um, mm -hmm. OK, we'll open the ticket uh, afterwards. 
And yeah. then uh, Victor comments on saying that uh, we should be careful when rebinding because uh, when you rebind the report, you, you are not allowed to download the report to the PBAX uh, if it's uh, reminded. Uh, um, no, you don't get a reminder at the moment. OK. Uh, there's a hands up from Sergio. Uh, if you want to open the microphone, Sergio, and ask your question. Any question? No, it's all right. It was it was just a verification clarification. OK. OK, uh, and it's the question that you type in the chat. Uh, yeah, but uh, oh. yeah, yeah, hard uh, responded actually in the same moment. Okay, okay. Perfect. perfect. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. so yeah, let them uh, just continue. So uh, you will also have like an option to update the content that's basically copying the report content to another report. Basically the same as rebind, just the other way around. Instead of like linking the report to another data set, you basically can copy the report content to another report that might be linked to another data set. OK. Um, for dashboards, um, there isn't really much that you can do, um, except, well, you can delete it. And there is no basic, no real APIs for that. Um, and also, we support data flows. So um, the same, very similar to, to the, to the data sets, you can also start a refresh here and have a list of all the refreshes that have been um, that have been triggered in the past. You can also see that there is like one via the API and one was triggered on demand, like via the um, web uh, web UI. Um, exactly. So now this one is running. I could also cancel the transaction or cancel that refresh if if necessary. Um, yeah. Then um, all these um, operations, especially for example, let me clone a report. Um, they take a couple of, so the API call takes a couple of parameters. Um, clone, and it can be very um, cumbersome to actually use this this UI that's provided by Visual Studio Code um, to to populate all those those settings. So I just cloned that report. Um, so what you can also do is um, you can just drag and drop um, specific items onto onto other ones. So for example, I can just take a report and drag it onto a data set. And there's basically two actions that are um, tied to this combination, like report and data set. You can say, OK, you want to rebind that report to that data set where you just dropped it on. Or you can also create a clone and also rebind it to that data set. OK, so that's 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 usually the way how how you would use um, the different um, capabilities. Okay, there is a list of, of which actions are supported in um, in the documentation. OK, so um, now we basically um, well, uploaded a data set, did some configuration, did some refresh. So that one refresh should be done by now. Yeah, so that one just completed. Um, and what we would want to do next is uh, we want to do a deployment. OK, so we have like a development workspace that's in a premium um, capacity. And as you can see, we have already also prepared a, um, a test workspace that's hopefully, I hope we deleted everything, should be empty. OK, so. As I said, like we are also supporting um, deployment pipelines. So in my environment, I currently have access to three um, pipelines. The one that I want to use is the prod pipeline. OK, um, the development stage is already configured. OK, it points to my well development workspace. What I would want to do now is basically um, I want to associate my test um, stage with my test environment or with my test workspace. So again, what I do, I can just drag and drop my workspace onto, onto the um, test stage. And it says, OK, I can assign that workspace to that stage. And I have to confirm by specifying the name of the stage or one in that case. 
And as you can see now, now basically uh, my test wor workspace is associated with the test stage and I can do a deployment. OK, so that's pretty straightforward now. So I can just take my simple report, for example, and also my simple data set. So it supports multi-select and I can say, OK, I only want to um, deploy those two items. There is this deploy selection um, button at the top. Doing this, I can add a command and I can also update the app um, if there is one associated with, um, the, with the target workspace, which is not the case here. So it's now basically starting the deployment. Usually takes some time um, and you will see that it has already deployed one of the, of the data sets here. Let me refresh it. And now it's also the second one here. So basically, we just deployed those two data sets um, to a different workspace. And as you can imagine, that's not only working for data sets, but it's also working for reports and dashboards and data flows. So let me also just deploy those, adding a comment again. Don't want to update the app. And now those, oh, yeah. Uh, it's probably complaining because the data set is not yet deployed. Let me just deploy everything. Don't update the app. Okay. Once the stuff is deployed, I can also go in here, refresh once, and I can see the data sets that have been deployed using the deployment pipeline. Okay. So that's that's pretty cool. So as you see, like you can do deployments without actually leaving Visual Studio Code. Um, what you would usually do after a deployment, um, you would probably change the parameters. So you would go here and say, okay, the server name is now pointing to a different SQL database, like to my test database. Or you could just change it here um, and and run another refresh. Or um, what you could also do, um, you could um, create deployment rules that does this override of the data source of the parameters during the deployment. Okay. Unfortunately, there is no API for that. So that's why I cannot support this in the Visual Studio Code extension. So that's something that would need to be configured in the Power BI service. Okay. Um, so should also refresh the others anyway. Um, so once I'm basically have deployed everything to to my next stage um i want to show you some other features uh, which would be notebooks so going back to my to my original data set because this one is populated um there is one more feature that i haven't um expanded yet so you can also um browse the metadata of that uh, particular data set so it shows you all the tables. It gives you information about the columns in those tables. Um, it shows you all the measures and it gives you also um, a list of all the petitions that are part of that table. OK, so that's really, really valuable information for an admin and also for a developer. Um, you can also just hover over the, um, the measure, for example, and see the measure definition in the expression. So for example, that would just be like a simple sum. Um, I'm looking for ways to uh, give you like a more, like a nicer interface for that. Uh, but as of now, it's just like in the tooltip. Okay. What's also pretty cool is what you can do is um, there is a functionality called load column statistics. Let me do that. Um, and what it's happening, what's happening in the background, it's basically um, calling a, there is a function column statistics that you can call and it gives you the min and max value and count of all the, the items in, in, in that particular table. So you can see that uh, we have, um, I don't know what makes sense, a due date key and there is 1,124 different entries. In there, uh, there is a min value from um, 10th January 2011, and the last, the max value is the 9th February 2014. So that can be also be very, very valuable information. Um, but I actually wanted to jump to 
um, to notebooks. So on top of every tree view, you have like this notebook open in a new Power BI notebook that basically opens a notebook for you um, that you can then ex use to execute um, some specific um, commands. So usually everything that's not available in the UI yet, you can use um, the notebooks to, to, um, to run more advanced commands, let's say. Um, I have, you can also save this notebook in, in, on your local drive. And I've also prepared um, a notebook with some demos. So I'll just open this one and close the other one that was just created for me. So um, there is one specific variable that set API path. That's the root where, where all the other um, API commands start. If you want to execute um, DAX queries as shown below, you need to set it at least to a data set because the DAX statement needs to be executed against the data set. So once you have set the API path, you can say, OK, um, percentage DAX, and then you can write any DAX query. That's just like the info tables functions, for example, but you can also execute a summarize or whatever. Like basically it supports any DAX that's also supported, like, I don't know, DAX Studio or whatever. Um, there are some um, additional things that are also nice to know. So for example, if I, you can use the um, the browser in the workspace to actually um, That does make sense. Let's say promotion key. There is like this insert path or insert code statement that takes the name of that um, of that column and inserts its DAX representation into into your code. Okay, so that's that's pretty convenient. Um, we also support variables. So besides this um, set API path, you can basically create any variables that you want. So I'm setting my value to one, two, three, and then I can use that in my DAX expression. It's basically, it just substitutes um, dollar brackets my value by one, two, three. Okay. Um, when you're running DAX, um, it's usually executed against the default data set that's used or that's specified by set API path. But you can also um, run it against um, different data sets. So what you can do is you can say just percent dax, and then um, type a slash. And slash is basically um, once you type a slash, the IntelliSense kicks in. And as you can see, it, it provides you all the um, all the endpoints that exist in the API. So you can go to groups and then do another slash, and then it lifts you all the groups or workspaces that you have access to. Um, then again, data sets, and then you maybe you want to link or execute the DAX against a different um, a different data set than the, um, the default data set of that particular notebook. That's very convenient, especially if you want to compare um, results of DAX statements executed against the dev data set versus the same DAX executed against the production data set, for example. Okay, so that's that's something that you can use. Um, what's also very, uh, very cool is um, that, as I said, you can also execute API calls. So let's assume um, I want to get a list of the refreshes for the current data set. I can just say get. Um, then using dot for um, like the current data set or the current API path, say slash, then the IntelliSense kicks in again and then say slash get dot slash refreshes. And it gives you a list of all the refreshes that happen for that particular data set. Okay. And obviously well, that works for all the API endpoints that you that you have seen here. So you can also get, I don't know, parameters gives you the list of the parameters that are in there and all the others and as you can see like this intelligence also provides you a lot of um information that you might otherwise not even be aware of that exists like the api calls like discover gateways or whatever okay so let's stick with refreshes here and you cannot only do get requests you can also do 
uh, post requests, for example. So you can say post slash refreshes, then it would just post a refresh. What you can also do though, and what we also provide is um, so-called examples. So you, you have a list of, of examples or um, templates at the bottom that say, okay, you want to only refresh a particular petition, for example, okay? So um, it gives you like an idea of how a, um, a query for, or the API call for the refra uh, advanced refresh API would look like, okay? So you can specify a set of objects in here and then trigger a partial refresh, for example. So um, going back to our petitions on the left side, you can just say, okay, now I have like the, the basic structure of my of my refresh call, and I can just say, okay, um, insert my 2019 petition here, and I also want to um, process 2020, and maybe also, I don't know, a single day here. Okay, now I have an API call and I can just say run. And it's basically a creating a refresh operation for me that just executes those or just refreshes those three petitions. Okay, and then if I call the get refreshes API again, you can see it's now a third one that was just executed now. It's, um, UTC, so that's why it's 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 one um, one hour behind, and it was that fast because like those are empty. But in general, like you just see like the the refreshes immediately in the APIs once once you trigger them. And again, you can use any API call here. Okay, so everything that's doable via APIs, you can you can do from here. Any questions about that? Yes, we have a few questions in the chat. Uh, Victor is asking, uh, uh, what about apps? We, we've seen something in uh, the, the deployment pipelines. There's something that automatic updates the apps. Is there something more to, to see about the apps? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so that's, that's a very, very common question when it comes to um, deployment pipelines. Um, currently, there is no API that allows you to update an app. So um, usually, like when when you have like um, consumers of 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 your reports, you will usually publish an app and add the the reports and the data sets to that app. Okay. So now, if you if you uh, if you update the report, um, in order for the viewers to have the the latest version of the report also in the app, you need to update the app. That's something that usually can only be done manually in the Power BI service. So there is no dedicated API that, that you could just call and say update app. Don't ask me why, it's just not there. Mm -hmm. The only way how this works or how or that can be done is um, using deployment pipelines. Okay, if you do a deployment, um, let me open it again. If you do a deployment, um, there is an option that as part of the deployment, you can also specify that after the deployment, you want to update the app. And that's what you what you're basically seeing here. That if if I I don't know deploy take a data set, you can specify a command, and then you can it also asks you whether you want to update the app. Okay, okay. so that's that's a way. Like assuming the target works because obviously obviously has an app configured, which also has to be done manually. Um, this way would allow you to also update the app in a program, more or less programmatic way. So let's say that um, uh, if one day Microsoft will create a set of APIs that manage apps, uh, they will be managed by default by your application that. Uh, surround the standard APIs. Yeah, no, well, I, I would need, well, you could do it in the notebook, yes, that would okay. work immediately as soon as the API is available, mm -hmm. uh, but it would take some time until I also integrate it in the UI, which okay. is obviously okay. a bit more work. Okay, and uh, <coughs> there's another question uh, from Victor that asks uh, if uh, 
Uh, you can manage also permissions on the workspace from your uh, uh, um, UI in this moment. From the UI, not um, because like there's a good reason for that is that you don't really get like um, a list of users, for example, or a list of groups that you would be allowed to to add mm -hmm. um, to to a workspace or to um, yeah to a report or whatever which item you want to set permissions. Um, I do have an example though. Um, so for example, if you have like a gateway and you want to set permissions on a particular data source, um, mm -hmm. you can like post a user message and add a user to, I'll just show it to you. So, so I just set the, the default um, path. Now I can call get users. And says okay currently it's only me assigned as a reader to that um, data source in that gateway i can use a post request um, and also add another user via the apis and then calling get user again and well i can also manage this here and i can also delete the user so that's like just a particular api call that you, that you need to um, execute and once you do that the user is, is also gone from here so you can use it um, but you need to know the email address, which is probably pretty straightforward. Uh, mm -hmm. When it comes to uh, Active Directory groups, I think you need to provide the object ID or the... Um, I think it's the object ID that you need to provide, which you probably usually will not have at hand. But technically, if you know the, which API call you want to, um, you want to, you want to run, you can also do that. Perfect. And uh, I think you have showed this uh, on the slides, but uh, uh, Jose asked uh, how to connect to other tenants. So. Yeah. OK, so that's um, part of the Visual Studio code settings. Um, as of now, I am connected to my, let's say, home tenant. We go here. Um, if I open the settings, uh, preference settings, um, I have defined those in the workspace. Um, so you could either change them here um, in the Power BI tenant. Um, I don't know it, but I have it. Oh, it's not in this. Um, give me a second. Let's see. So we can open this one. So that's the tenant ID of a remote tenant that I have access to. So I can just go here, paste that setting. Um, and in order to refresh it, I you can click um, the button at the, like the Power BI um, tab at the bottom that, that says, or that exposes your current name. And then you can see it says, okay, connected to tenant 935, that's my, my other tenant. If I go to Power BI again, it's now like listing the workspace from, from the remote tenant. Great, great. Let me undo uh, that. Mm -hmm. uh, in the meantime, Sergio asks uh, if uh, your tool can be used without installing, um, uh, probably due to company restriction on installation or something like that. Do you have something yeah. like portable, I mean? Yeah, so for Visual Studio Code, there is a, a user-only installer, and I think there is only, also a downloadable zip. So that would probably work. Uh, but as I mentioned, what you can also do is you can just go to um, another, there you go, to vscode.dev. Okay, that basically exposes the very same UI that you that I've just shown you, like basically Visual Studio Code. Um, again, go to extensions, search for Power BI VS Code install it and then you have the very same ui and the very same functionalities that i've just shown you so that's not installing anything it's just basically doing api calls from your browser and well kind of visualizing them okay so most of the features should also be available just via the browser great i didn't know about this uh, vscode.dev so it's uh 
another thing to learn today. Yeah, it's the same for, for GitHub code spaces, which are probably more popular, but mm -hmm. it's basically the same, right? Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, Thank you. the last thing that I want to show, um, I know I'm already running over time. I hope it's okay. No, <laughs> no problem. No problem. Um, is the capability to um, edit a data set. So um, you can just click on a data set, assuming it's residing in a, in a premium uh, workspace, and say edit Timble. What's happening is that it's spinning up this proxy in the background. Should. Okay, it's not working here. Unauthenticated. Okay. Sorry about that. Start to work instead. Okay, so like connecting to my workspace again, my data set, edit Timble. And what's happening, it's now starting in the background, this Timble proxy, that's like the, the C sharp um, .NET application that I've written, that, that acts as a proxy between the table object model library and my Visual Studio Code extension. So again, I, I log in. And it should give me. Uh, OK. That's because I do have two with the same name. Let me delete this one. Oh, what's okay? That's demo gods are not with me. <laughs> Let me open the workspace again. I just tried it before and it worked just fine. Demo effect, as always. <laughs> Yes, okay, let's give it another try. So I select the works the, the data set, click edit Timble, prompted for the login. So um again, like similar to Duck Studio or Tableau Editor, which also uses the Tom library, you need to, to log in. Even though you are already logged into Visual Studio Code. So that's yeah, that's the topic. There's also a solution for that. Um you can specify your own client ID. Um, to commute to do the communication, then it would all would also use the authentication that's used in in Visual Studio Code. So also described in the docs. So if you don't want to have like this pop up each and every time you do an edit Timble, um, you need to um, configure that. So um, yeah, now what we have is basically we have a representation of the data set in in the Timble format. So it shows up in the in the in the in the regular solution explorer, and you can just browse through all the different definitions. So let's assume uh, we do have like um, sales, fake internet sales here. I have a measure of sales quantity. I can just go here and say, okay, I want uh, sales quantity times two. Say times two. Um, then there is this lineage tag that has to be unique. Um, so I just change it. And once I've done this, I can say, okay, um, validate. I can validate. That's a different one. That's not the one I changed. Ah, because it's the same. It's the same name. Sorry. So, um, yeah, so I just created a new measure basically. So I copied an existing one and had to change that tag. I 
just before I created another one to say it's quantity three, but I also just changed the lineage tag to the same name. So that's why it was complaining. Um, once I have um, validated it, I can also deploy it. OK, it's basically now publishing those changes to the um, Power BI data set, to the online data set. Um, once the publish is finished, it also asks you whether you want to process the data set, because like if you, for example, edit a new table or edit a new calculated column, whatever, um, you can process it directly from here, or you can also open it in Power BI. So let's do that. Open it in Power BI. And now if we go to fact internet sales, we see our sales amount times two. Or sales quantity times two, sorry. So that's an easy way how you can modify an existing um, online data set. Okay. It's not super straightforward yet, um, um, but there will be some, some releases recently about Tyndall. Um, also with regards to the um, Power BI um, project file format, which will also be using Timbal in the near future. So that will be uh, quite a popular um, lang well, definition language in, in, in the near future. And what's also um, really cool about this is that you can easily do like a find replace because it's basically just a text file. Yeah, um, I think that's all I wanted to cover. Um, I right. didn't go through capacities or gateways. As I said, it's just read only. You can drill into those. It's not really much information in there. Maybe for the gateways, um, you see the data sources in there. Um, but yeah, I think that that's about it. Great. Um, yep. I see many compliments inside the the chat for your amazing tool. Um, it seems uh, while you were showing to us this tool, uh, it seems you are transforming VS Code into SQL Server Management Studio for Power BI, and this is a big compliment to uh, that, some. Uh, some parts are. <laughs> are definitely true, um, especially like like having like those new info functions and ducks um, exactly. allowed me to actually also expose like tables and, and data set metadata as part of the extension, which was really cool. Um, yes. And there's even more. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to to integrate more of those info functions so that, for example, you also see the roles and the users in the roles in there and whatever is exposed via those functions. Um, I'm also looking forward to also connect to um, Power BI desktop data sets in the future mm -hmm. using that um, Timdl um, editor, um, but that's still a work in progress and nothing nothing to show yet. And yeah, if, if any of you has any any other um, requests or ideas on, on what would be cool to have in there, I encourage you to just like go to the Git repository, open an issue or a feature request, and then I'll I'll definitely have a look at it, and maybe you also want to contribute. So it's as I said, it's an open source um project, and everyone is very welcome to to help uh, making it even better. Great, thank you very much, Gerard. And I do not see any other question in uh, in the chat uh, for people that uh, will see this uh, recorded on YouTube. Uh, you have all the contacts, all the information from Gerd, so you can reach him and uh, ask him any question for any future. As he said, that you can contribute to this amazing project that it's very um, impressive from my humble opinion. So.